I'm Lewis Matheson, I'm a physics teacher and I absolutely love using Lego because, well, because it's Lego and it's awesome, but it also can be used to explain really difficult concepts in a straightforward way that people understand. Now let's just think about the model of the atoms. So you might be familiar with some protons and neutrons in the middle, maybe represented by coloured circles, and then we've got some electrons orbiting the outside. Now, this is not what the atom actually looks like. It's not actually that colour and it's not to that scale, but that's a common model that we use to explain what's going on. Now, what I have over here is my scientific grattanol tray full of Lego, and we can actually use this to explain everything. I mean, everything that we can observe in the universe. So we can use this to explain about some of the particles and the nuclear physics that really makes things tick. So nuclear physics, it's not as difficult as it sounds, it's just concerning the nucleus of an atom. So let's have a look at the atom in a bit more detail. Now inside the atom there are positive charges and I'm going to represent these with these two by two yellow bricks. I mean why not, they don't actually have any colour but these are a really good way to represent these positive charges. And in the early part of the 20th century, they discovered the electron, these small negative particles. So I'm going to represent those by these one by one grey pieces. Now, one of the early models of the atom, they had the negative and positive charges dispersed randomly throughout the atom. Later on, they actually discovered that there was this dense positive nucleus and surrounding this, we had the electrons. And then a couple of years later, they actually realised that the electrons existed in distinct energy levels. And later on, in the 1930s, they discovered there were other particles inside the atom which had no charge. So these red two by two are going to be my neutrons. And so this is a model of the atom that uh, a lot of you are very familiar with. It's only later on when we made even more discoveries and lots more research was carried out that we found that the electrons, they're not always particles, they also travel like waves. And there's this kind of probability shell around the outside of the atom where the electrons might be. However, that's a little bit difficult to represent waves using Lego, but Lego is brilliant for explaining this particle physics. So inside the atom, we had electrons, we had protons and neutrons, and everything seemed nice and simple because these are the building blocks of matter that all of the atoms are made out of, and therefore everything that we can see in the universe around us. So the electrons, first of all, these are fundamental particles. They can't be split up into anything smaller. But then we've got the protons and neutrons. And as time went on, they found that these could actually be split up further. And these are actually made out of other particles called quarks. Now, there are three quarks in a proton and three quarks in a neutron. And they're made out of quarks called up and down quarks. In a proton, they found that there is an up, a down and an up. So that made a proton. Whereas in a neutron, there is a down, an up and a down quark. And as time went on, they actually discovered four more quarks. We had the charm and the strange, the top and the bottom. And in addition to the electron, we also found that we had things which were like electrons, but they had a positive charge, which we call positrons. And these are actually antimatter. What we find is in addition to all the matter that we have, we also have antimatter. So just like we can have a proton, we can also have an antiproton. We can have a neutron and an antineutron. The scientists also discovered that in addition to the electron, we had things which were like electrons, but a bit heavier, that we called muons. And also we had other particles called tau particles. So these things here were similar to electrons, just heavier. And later on, scientists discovered other particles which were similar to electrons, but they had no charge and no mass. And this is what we call neutrinos. In actual fact, we have electron, muon and tau neutrinos. So these are the fundamental particles from which everything else is made, and this is called the standard model. So most things are made out of up and down quarks and electrons, and the other things maybe only come into existence for a very short amount of time, often in high energy particle collisions. Oh, by the way, in the standard model, we also have these exchange particles called bosons, which are to do with forces, but let's not go there at the moment. Now inside the atom, it's the number of protons which defines the chemical element. Carbon always has six protons. So carbon might be bonded to hydrogen to make our hydrocarbon fuel, which is used in combustion in our engines and vehicles. It might also be used by plants as they're using carbon dioxide. So this is carbon bonded to some oxygen. But not all carbon is the same. Most of the carbon is called carbon-12. So that has six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus. But we also have things called isotopes. 
Now this is going to be the same element, but it's got a different number of neutrons. So carbon-14 has an extra two neutrons in the nucleus. It's actually formed by nitrogen in the upper atmosphere being bombarded by cosmic radiation from the sun. Now, this is actually slightly radioactive, but it's chemically behaving in the same way as carbon-12. So living organisms, they respire and they have carbon-14 inside them. In actual fact, when we look at archaeological specimens, we can look at things which were once living, so it could be plants, it could be animals or even humans. And if we take a sample of that organism, we can actually look at the ratio of carbon-14, which decreases over time, compared to the ratio of carbon-12, which stays the same. And by looking at the amount of these two different isotopes, we can actually work out the age of that uh, archaeological specimen. So what we have are stable and unstable nuclei, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the second part of the video. We'll be back to Lewis in just a moment, but first let me tell you about Skillshare. If you're watching this video, we know you enjoy learning, and that's where Skillshare comes in. The first 1,000 Beyond the Brick viewers to click the link in the description will get a two-month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. If you enjoy physics, there are hundreds of videos on Skillshare to help you learn more about the fascinating world around us. Don't forget that the first 1,000 Beyond the Brick viewers to click the link in the description will get a two-month free trial of premium membership. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now in physics, we love graphs because they can tell stories and explain the world around us. So for this graph or chart that I'm going to plot, I'm going to have the x and y axis as normal. And going across on the x axis, we're going to have the number of protons. And as you might recall, this defines which element we have. And up the side, I'm going to have the number of neutrons. Now let's start with a stable isotope, which I'm going to represent with one of these black one by one pieces. If we think about hydrogen, the simplest element we have, there's basically one proton in the middle. So I'm gonna put this down here where it's got basically one proton and zero neutrons. We then might have an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium. Now deuterium has one proton and one neutron. So I'm gonna put it here on the graph. We also have another isotope of hydrogen called tritium, one proton and two neutrons. So I'm gonna put it here on the graph. And I'm gonna be using a different color because this one is radioactive and it's unstable and it decays. We can then maybe think about things like helium, which has got two protons and two neutrons. So it goes here on the graph. And then we've got other things like lithium and beryllium. Now, if we were to keep plotting this with all the elements in the periodic table, plus all of their stable isotopes, we need another 250 or so of these small black pieces of Lego. But we can also add different isotopes which are unstable, but in different ways. And we can use these other bits of Lego for that. In actual fact, we need about three and a half thousand pieces of Lego. And that looks a bit like this. So this is my Lego nuclear chart. Now it extends quite a long way over there, but it's actually quite small compared to the one I based it on. And this was a project carried out at the University of York in the UK, where they made a massive one of these out of 27,000 pieces of Lego. Now, basically what we have is the height of the Lego tells us about the stability of that element. And what we have are the different elements going this way across the chart and the number of neutrons going up this way. And this shows all the different possible isotopes that could exist. Effectively, the lower the height of the Lego, the more stable it is. So this actually represents the mass excess energy per kilogram. And it's really high when we have things like uh, hydrogen. It gets lower down to the lowest point around iron. And then it gets higher again as we go up to things like uranium at the far end of the chart. Different colours represent different things. So what we have is different types of radioactive decay. So it could be pro it could be neutrons being emitted in the dark blue, it could be beta plus, which is a positron being emitted from the light blue. We've then got beta minus, which is a high-speed electron given out by the nucleus, or it could even be proton decay. 
Now, if we look at the far end of the chart over there, up here we have a lot of yellow and even some green. Now, the yellow represents alpha decay. So this is two protons and two neutrons emitted by the nucleus of a heavy element. And the green ones actually talk about something called spontaneous fission, which is basically when the nucleus of the atom, made up of protons and neutrons, is just so big that it's unstable and it just immediately splits apart. So this part of the graph is where we have the heavy elements. And some of them are so unstable they might only exist for less than a second in our particle colliders where we make them. Now, going back down the chart, we have the light nuclei. And what we can do is get the light nuclei to join together. And as they do so, they become heavier and heavier and more stable. And also, this releases energy. So, for example, in the sun at the moment, every second, about six million tonnes of mass is converted into pure energy, which is radiated out into space. That keeps us alive on Earth. We're also trying to do the same on Earth in our experimental fusion reactors. And these are using two isotopes of hydrogen. So we have deuterium and tritium. And the idea being that if we can combine these two together, it makes helium and also releases a huge amount of energy that we can use to boil water to turn turbines to generate electricity. So we can get light nuclei to join together in nuclear fusion. And if we go back up to this end of the chart, what we have up here are the heavy elements that we can split apart. So this is an isotope called uranium-235. And it's kind of stable, but all it needs is the injection of one neutron. So what happens is a neutron is absorbed by the uranium-235 nucleus. This then becomes unstable, and it actually split, splits apart to make two smaller nuclei. So these are the daughter nuclei, when one of these uranium splits in half. But it also gives out two to three other neutrons. And these can then go flying around and be absorbed by another uranium nucleus, which then splits apart and so on. And what we have then is a chain reaction where one thing causes something which is causing something else. And the advantage for this is that it can release a lot of energy, but it doesn't take much fuel. And this is what happens inside a nuclear fission reactor on Earth. So this is just a very simple nuclear fission reactor. We've got the pile here that has the uranium fuel rods in it. Now uranium has to be enriched, so there's the right amount of uranium-235, which is the fissionable isotope of uranium. We also have control rods. These have boron inside, and what they do is they absorb the excess neutrons. And that means we can control a rate of reaction, so one reaction causes one more, which causes one more. We don't have to be uncontrolled like a nuclear bomb. We also have things inside which act as moderators. And what these do is they slow down the really fast neutrons which are ejected from the atoms which are from the nuclei which are splitting apart. So that is often things like water. And also we can use water as a coolant. So the coolant is designed to take the excess heat away from the reactor. It goes through a heat exchanger and that then boils water which turns to steam and that causes turbines to move and generators to then generate electricity. So that is a very, very simple kind of schematic of how a nuclear fission reactor works. So that has just been a very, very brief introduction to nuclear physics, where we can use Lego to represent the nuclear atom and also to show this nucleus chart of stability. My name is Lewis Matheson from Physics Online. Thank you ever so much for watching and goodbye.